or am I? Are we live? We're live. Yeah, I caught it just in time. Yeah, How about you, you everybody? Welcome into the Auburn Live Call In Show. I'm your host, Jeffrey Lee, Senior Recruiting Editor for Auburn Live on three. Today is Sunday, March the 24th, 2024. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. I'll tell you why. Lots of recruiting going on. Auburn just picked up another commitment. Uh, didn't they? They did. Who was it? Ty Buster. That's what I said. So, <laughs> here, to, here to remind me, address your comments, answer your questions. Y'all, we're going to get to the phone lines as soon as possible. Mr. Allen Head, Mr. Cole Pinkston, how about you, fellas? How about you? All right. How about you, big dog? And you had me thrown for a second. I was like, wait a minute, he's talking about Ty Buster, right? Like, did we have somebody just commit before we came on and I'm the unprepared guy? That's, that's what I thought just happened here. When did Tabar <laughs> TJ Dice, did he commit um, last week? Last the 14th. Thursday. Okay, yeah, so, so we, we, we've had a call-in show since then. Yes. So yes. the last two weeks, Auburn has picked up. I'm telling you, man, I know Ty Buster is a consensus three-star uh, through the networks, but Auburn loves this kid. Cole will be the first to tell you. Um, big, big pickup for the interior offensive lineman. And uh, what, do you, what do you like about Ty, Cole? Uh, I like his feet. I like his feet. And, and he's uh, he's probably considered a swing guy for Auburn, meaning he could play guard or tackle. But I think his true value is at guard. I, I would, you know, maybe a little bit. I'm not comparing him to Dylan Wade. I'm comparing his his position to Dylan Wade, whereas you saw Dylan Wade can mm -hmm. play left tackle and he can be fine, but probably has more value as a guard, which is where he's going to play this season. I think Ty Buster's that way, and depending on how he grows into his body, I think he's still growing into his body. Some guys mature a little bit faster. You, we saw him. I think he's still growing into that frame. So uh, I like that pickup. Penn State and Florida were starting to get in there a little bit with him, but I really think Auburn just – they got there so early with this guy, it didn't matter. They were going to get him. I, I, they they fought for him early, and, and that's what happens. And, and I think they can hold on to when he gets some more buzz. Alan, uh, you know, going back this week, not just Ty Buster, but Auburn had some big, big dogs uh, visit this weekend and this past week. Let me throw some names at you, Alan. Uh, I thought the biggest one – just time wise was Hussan Longstreet, the four star quarterback, top 10 quarterback overall in the country, came from uh, California to visit. Uh, AJ Ea was in town all weekend. Carday Smith, big offensive tackle. Xavion Hardy, kind of a new name to the Auburn board, but a Juco defensive end, defensive lineman. They, all these guys visited. Spencer Dolan came in. Kalen Edwards, the big tight end from California, is arriving tonight or tomorrow night. Uh, man, there were so many others earlier in the week. Tariq Hayer, Josh Petty was here. Um, so it, what a great week, uh, Alan. From a outsider perspective, Cole and I were in there all week, kind of in and out, you know. But what, 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 what are you feeling, or what are you seeing, what are you thinking uh, after a week like we we just seen? Well, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head as far as importance. It, it's not the same number of recruits like the volumes a little bit different from last week this week it had a more of an intimate feel to it and then you look at the positions that they brought in heavy on the line of scrimmage and we've talked about that over and over again on the podcast that this is a huge class for offensive line and defensive line you saw both I mean from the offensive line standpoint getting Josh Petty there obviously having Ty Buster commit then you you know the, the guys that you had in this weekend from an important standpoint it's just it's massive for this class. And then Hussein Longstreet. I mean, that that's the end-all, be-all this week. You want your class to be centered around a quarterback, particularly a very talented signal caller, uh, somebody that has the kind of – or it can send the kind of shock waves if you land a commitment from him. That's going to resonate with other people, and that's going to be a head-turner to a degree and something that could be a catalyst in this class to maybe get a receiver or two that you might not necessarily be in the mix for. Hey, Cole, you've got to talk one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with Hussein. I thought the most interesting – we're going to get to the phone lines as soon as possible, folks. 701-779-9585. Uh, Go on and get in line, and uh, we're, we're going to get to as many as possible tonight. But, Cole, before we do, Hussan Longstreet, you got some face-to-face uh, -face time with him. I thought the biggest thing that I took from your interview was that he might come back before April the 14th. That's that's really the only thing I took from his interview because I had talked to Hussan beforehand, uh, before the visit. I wanted to get a preview of his visit and then talk to him again and see how it went. thought that was important because I'm going to tell you guys, I think if I'm making a top 
10 for Auburn recruits right now. He's number one, and the gap is wide. Mm. I think he's number one, regardless of position, for the 2025 class. That's the guy Auburn wants. Now, um, not going to be the easiest thing to do. Texas A&M is in there. Uh, this is quarterback recruiting. You, you just don't know sometimes, but we know he's April 14th decision. Like you said, the most important thing from that interview, because I feel like he was a little bit more closed up talking to him after the visit. I was surprised. I, I was expecting him to be a little bit more in depth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, a little more closed up. That's fine. You know, it's a little different in that setting, but when, you know, I always like to ask the question, where does Auburn stand for you right now? Where does Auburn stand for you after this visit? That's when he got a little smile, laughed a little bit. They're up there. That's how he left it, trailed it off. And then he said, you know, are you going to come back before your decision? There's a possibility he comes back for a day. Mm. There's a chance. There's a chance. Mm. We Keep an eye out for that. And, and he's supposed to visit Texas A&M again. He's already visited them once. That's why you're seeing a lot of predictions because two visits just make sense. Sure. And that, that very well may be the choice for Hussan. Uh, we, we'll see. But if Auburn gets him back on campus on A-Day, we got ourselves a ball game here. I already think there is one. But you, let's see what happens for that. Uh, I'm curious. No, I agree completely. And, it, I mean, I, I'm tracking one other quarterback that we haven't talked about on the show that I think Auburn's going to go out and see throw in spring. Uh, if Houston Longstreet doesn't commit to Auburn on the 14th. So, got another name there. But uh, 100%, you want a signal call in this class, and that's the guy. Let's mm -hmm. see if they can't close the gap there. And Ole Miss, Oregon, also in the mix, too. Mm -hmm. We'd be remiss not to mention them as well. Sure. But I think this is going to boil down to Auburn AM. and m Or at least that's the outside feel I've got right now. Zach busting up, coming to the front. Must have some calls before we do. If anybody is in or around Auburn, Opelika, Lee County, look no further for the real estate help that you might need. Jessica Andrews with the Talents Group. Give her a call, 334-704-4442. She is a five-star realtor. <laughs> if you don't believe us, just ask us. And if you say she's not, I'll call you a liar. Because she is. She's a five-star five, five realtor. If you don't believe me, you can ask uh, oh, oh, Kelly Greenbook. Kelly Green, but was a uh, – oh, she gave us her POW one week. Speaking of POWs, we're going to have to get to that. But anyways, Jessica Andrews with the Talents Group. Give her a call, 334-704-4442. Tell her we sent you. Uh, we had the – um, we had a couple of suggestions on the Auburn Live message board, the corner, and I can't remember them. I heard them, but I didn't listen. I remember, I remember one of them was um, what is a weird food combination you like, which that I liked that one because oh. – Food's been a There's, big hot topic for Cole this week. I, well, it always is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the things that are important on this show, food and football. It's up there. Maybe it's another. There. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, weird combinations. Give me an example. Like my, well, well, we, I told you about one the other day, Jeffrey. Dill pickle, like a, one of those big pickles you are talking about. Ballpark pickles. With – Movie theater about popcorn. Now that's not the that's, craziest thing in the world. No, that's pretty weird. Is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's I'm bad. almost positive that I have been to a movie before and they advertise go get you a dill pickle with your. Oh, with they your have popcorn. for sure. It, they have. It's just not my style. Like I, I, I'm with Jeff. Sure. That's a that's a mix of like sour with and salty. salty. Yeah. yeah, that I'm, I'm not in. necessarily accustomed to. So like, y'all are all sweet salty. Mobiles are all out on us to advertise pickles with popcorn, apparently, at our movie theaters. So maybe I missed that. <laughs> Bro, I'm backwoods country. You know what I mean? Me and Cole, the same neck of the woods here. So there's nothing. Enterprise, Alabama, absolutely. You're going to get a deal pickle and then some popcorn hey, mixed together, my man. I'll tell you this. When, when Emily was pregnant with our son, mm -hmm. she liked a cinnamon crunch. You lost me at cinnamon, first of all. Mm. Cinnamon crunch bagel with ham. And melted Swiss cheese. Ooh. Yep. See, the only thing I could think of for me would be, you know, the pear salad. I mean, anybody who's make, mixing pears, mayonnaise, cheese, and a cherry on top. That's I – mean, <laughs> But that's fine dining in the South, baby. I mean, like, let's be honest here. I mean, there are a lot of people that eat pear salad. It, it is a weird combo, though. Mayonnaise and but pears. It, yeah, I can't, I can't think of a, like a combo for me. I 
off the top. I can't either. I don't even I know where like people, start with that. People will have good ones. There's some if weird ones have, out if there. If you have a weird combo of food that you like, let us know. If not, join the in club. the chat. They one person said ranch and pizza, which is a debatable combo. That's, common. That's pretty mm. common. I like that. I, uh, I can't do uh, it, uh, man. Habanero poblano ranch with uh, carrots and broccoli and celery. But I mean, that's, that's, just, putting, dressing. that's just putting that's a little spice to it, baby. Ain't this nobody fill up. Nobody eating mayonnaise and peanut butter. The chat. That's no. crazy. He's a he's a he's a serial killer. One hundred percent. And to steal Anthony's line, absolutely a serial killer. If you're mixing mayonnaise, <laughs> and peanut butter. Yeah, no, no. I'll tell you what. It, everybody who tells me they don't like ranch, there ain't no way we're eating the same ranch. There is nothing now, better than you, man. Homemade you ranch. Cold. Uh, little Rez, Little Rez, oh, Red Schoolhouse got the yeah. best homemade ranch dressing. I'm telling you. Oh, no, I, I'm homemade ranch. Now, look, if you're getting like Hidden Valley from the no, grocery store, that. okay, okay. Like, I don't eat that. I can understand where somebody's got their nose turned up with a little bit of that. I'm a okay. ranch, I'm a ranch snob, Alan. You're a ranch it's, connoisseur, I hear you, Cole. It's got to be mm. homemade. Apparently, okay. people's weird combos all have to do with peanut butter. We have mint ice cream with peanut butter. Which that I can't get behind that, and then someone said pizza and peanut butter. Yeah, no, man, come on, uh, you, no you, chance. Then you're not even eating pizza. You know what I mean? Like that's a whole you other think concoction. Just making this up, got to it be. Might be. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take the. First one I've seen so far. Look, <laughs> I'm not going to take the comments too seriously. I want to hear somebody tell me what they eat. If, if we're gonna with yeah. let, let me hear their voice. Okay, peaches let's go, was, yeah, peaches let's with let's salmon. Go to Kevin. Kevin for Wilmer will be our first there caller. There he is. That's smelling some sex up in here. Let's eat that, man. <laughs> Kevin from Wilmer. What's happening, Kevin? I got three questions for you, Jeffrey Lee. Okay, Kevin from Wilmer. How many, how many touchdowns? Will uh, Markham Simmons have? Okay. Okay, that's one. I'm going to write that down. What else you got, Kevin? How many touchdowns will Perry Thompson have? Okay, I like that. I like that. One more. And how many interceptions the, uh, the Marcus Riddick get? Oh, oh. interesting. Okay, I, I I like it, Kevin. These are I, I like these questions because it'll get you talking. Because you've got to you've got to start at the top with with these guys. How much they're going to be playing? How many projections as far as uh, targets they get each game? Demarcus Riddick. How much is he going to play? How many opportunities is he going to have to have an interception? So I will uh, I will put the I'll set the over under at Demarcus Riddick at point five, half an interception. I will put the TDs for Perry Thompson at one and a half. I'll put the Malcolm Simmons at a half. Okay. Because I think so, he's going to redshirt. I, I see. That's my that's my thing. I think he might get a look in four games. Malcolm Simmons. I don't know that there is a glaring need. He might just be so good that he gets into the fall, and, and I, we don't know. But he's not here in the spring, same as Perry Thompson. Although Malcolm Simmons has been at every practice that I've been yes, up there yeah. for, he's there. He's watching. He's he's right there with those guys. But I don't know how much more than four games. And that's you're looking at probably spot duty in those four games, Alan. I would agree with that. And here's the other thing with Malcolm, and we don't talk about this enough. Freak athlete. And I know they recruited him to play wide receiver. But that kid could easily end up at nickel in mm. – you know what I mean? As as far as DJ Durkin's defense goes, I mean, if they get over there and they realize, like, hey, he's better suited to play on the other side of the ball, there's nothing that would prohibit him from being flipped. Now, I think Malcolm Simmons thinks he's a wide receiver. I think Hugh Freeze believes he's a wide receiver and he's going to get his first, you know, look there. But I mean, we talked about Carlos Dansby the other day. He was also told he was going to get his first look at wide receiver and where he end up. <laughs> In the NFL. Should be, I mean, at yeah. linebacker. Right. Yeah. Well, think about Rudy Ford got his first look at running back and then ended up becoming, you know, a, a fantastic defensive back at Auburn. Tyrone Green. Yeah. Defensive There's a lot, of guys. There's a lot of guys that have ended up like that. 
Hey, watch out for Malcolm Simmons as a punt slash kick returner. Okay. Watch out. I thought, I thought you were going to say emergency punter, and I'd buy that one for goal. sure. Let me ask you yep. this, goal. Emergency punter, too. Do you think they would burn his red shirt just to return punts and kicks? No. No, but um, I think getting Keontae Scott out of that role would probably be good. I, I completely agree. Now, I, I don't know if they'll agree with that. They may not. But is Keontae seemed, too valuable on the defense to risk him in the special teams? See how much how much better is Malcolm Simmons in the field as it pertains to returning punts and kicks? That's what you don't. I mean, he's he's special in the open field. There's no question about that. And when you get in full contact come fall practice, and he kind of maybe he does something you weren't expecting by yeah. comparison to some of the other candidates. I could see his Richard getting burned for that. Because it's still development. I mean, he's going to have to sure. play sooner rather than later anyway on one side of the ball or another. Man, do you want a true freshman back there catching punts, though? No. I mean, not ideally. But, again, how talented is the kid? And that's it's an interesting. You, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Alan. No, you're good. You're good. The, our board was, was clamoring the other day, and I hate to bring up basketball, but they were clamoring for a sports psychologist, right? And if you've never taken a sports psychology – class it they put you in situations like a free throw that you have to make in a tight situation well malcolm simmons has already been catching punts in tight situations just as the punter i mean it, oh he can boom it too can that's that's he not an easy it, it in our or no, in my class i took they rank the situations that are the toughest making a free throw when you have you know when the game's on the line making a clutch putt these are the things catching a punt in football ranks in there like as the punter, that's a high intensity situation. So I think that if there's any freshman that could do it, Malcolm Simmons is the one that comes to mind to me. Yeah, I mean, it's, okay. So, 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 one, uh, will Malcolm Simmons have a receiving touchdown at the end of the year? No, I'm going to say no as well. I'm going to take. Yeah, I'm not meaning. Either. I am going to say he's going to have one rushing touchdown though. No. Is he going to take a, a carry away from Jeremiah Cobb? I think he might get one on like a jet sweep, something yeah, of that yeah, nature. He he 23, big doll. If you're not giving it 23, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will say this, man. I, I really like Derek Nix. I really yes, like DJ Dirk. And I finally got some, some to, to, to meet and talk a little bit more with them, as well as uh, Charles Kelly. Fantastic guys. I really mm -hmm. like them. I'm really curious. And, and I tell you what, if you didn't watch the Derek Nix interview, I think – uh, I think JG Tate asked him about calling plays, and he goes, "You're looking at him." Yeah, Who, like, he did. Going to call the play. You're looking at him, big dog. So uh, that'll be uh, that'll be interesting. This season's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Perry Thompson, one point five. He's coming in in uh, July, maybe June, July after he finishes high school. He'll be in for summer workouts. Is he going to get enough targets? Because we've seen we've seen some wide receivers step up. I see. I still think he gets in the two deep. I still think he gets in the two deep, and I'm going to go. Yes, he's going to have more than two. Uh, he's going to have two touchdowns, so more yep. than the one and a half. I think so too. I agree. Does anybody remember what I set Cam Coleman's over and under at? Like four and a half. Four and a half, I think. Yeah, Something like that. And I think we I all think went with the over. Higher is a range, if I'm not mistaken. Six to eight on the range. Yeah, there you go. I think so. So, so I mean, we're going. If and, you and combine all four of them, you're saying that this freshman class is going to have 10 to 12 touchdowns this year combined between the top four guys? Yeah, yeah. Don't See, I went, uh, I went under on Bryce because well, I just don't know in the slot how, how much. We have him at two and a half? Get. Yes. Yeah. Two and a half, and, and I, I thought one or two for Bryce Kane, probably two to three for Perry Thompson, five to six for Cam. So, yep. yeah, 10 to 12. In this freshman class, Malcolm, if he gets in there. Uh, now, Demarcus Riddick, uh, Camden wanted to know about interceptions. I'm putting it at a half, and I'm, I'm taking the under because I, I think Demarcus ends up redshirting. I think so, too. But I think that's as talented an athlete as he is. And, and Cole, Jeffrey, please get in here. And You guys have seen him live in action. But as talented as he is, he's still learning how to play linebacker. He played all over the defense in high school where he would be a rush outside linebacker at one point, a deep safety at another. I think there's even clips of him playing cornerback on his high school tape. 
so to be a dedicated linebacker and to learn to play in the box, which is mm. probably one of the most difficult positions to play on a football field when everything's coming at you so quickly to train your eyes and your mind to process at a speed that you're not accustomed to, that's going to be really difficult. Now, maybe they drop him back in coverage and use him as a star or something of that nature, and that's where you get your interception. But I tend to believe they're going to try to treat him as an in-the-box linebacker and get him up to speed and, and keep him in that one spot. When you have young guys, you want to train them in one spot, let them get a feel for the college game, and then you'll start to expand them. You don't want to put too much on their plate to begin with. But, Cole, Jeffrey, what do you guys think? Cole, what do you think about him physically? Because we've seen him more than anybody coming through the halls. DeMarcus is always in and out of there, coming over to say hello. He looks thin to me. But, Cole, you know more about this than I do. I don't know that he's fit. When I'm looking at him in street clothes, I'm going, man, you know, I don't see this SEC linebacker. I see a high school kid who will be. But yeah, am I, what do you think, Cole? You know more about it than I do. Yeah, well, that's the good – to me, that's good news. He's, he's He has not reached his potential with his frame yet. And I think he's a 230, 235-pound guy when it comes down to it. He's probably 215 right now, maybe you. 220. Um, but that is good. That is what you want. And, look, he, he, I mean, usually a guy of his age would be going to prom right now. Yes. He's at Auburn. He's at Auburn already. Um, so I, I think he's got some developing to do from a physical standpoint. From an athletic standpoint, there's you can't create a better linebacker in the lab, really. You just got to get him. Look, to play in the box, just like you're saying, Alan, you got to have a screw loose. Yes. Something's got to be wrong with you in the head. It helps. Just about. It, you you got to want to take on guys that are 100 pounds heavier than you coming downhill at you. That's right. And bounce off that. And if you don't have a screw loose, you have to be coached how to be that way. And I'm not saying – I don't know whether DeMarcus Riddick is that way or not, but he's more he's more apt to covering. I watched him cover a lot in high school. So – that for that reason too, I think it's going to take a little bit of time. So totally. if I'm picking on Kevin's question, it's an under for sure. Do you think he's? Do you think he sees action in four games? What if I put the total tackles for at ten and a half for Demarcus Riddick? I think he's going to play on special teams. Now this, is, I don't think he's going to redshirt. I think he is going to be on kickoff. You know what I mean? Multiple coverage teams for Auburn. I think you're going to utilize that speed and yep. athleticism as a way to integrate him and get him accustomed to the speed of the college game because like you re- you realize that this is a kid that's trying to be at Auburn for three years and in the NFL. Like, that is his plan. So you might as well maximize him while he's here. Ten and a half tackles? Yeah, I'll go ten and a half. I think he gets I'll, most of that on special teams. I like over, I like too, because you think, like, late in, like, the A&M game or something, that they're trying to run out the clock. You want to get them some reps. You can get five or six in some of those – "Quote unquote cupcake games late Alabama, you know. yeah. Okay, yeah, no, <laughs> not that's, that's that's I was like, I, I mean, I I know I'm the official Jimbo hater, but I yeah. was gonna say, man, <laughs> mighty confident there, Zach. Yeah, my, my f my FCS came through. A and M yeah. to me is Alabama A and M. But um, right. before we get to the next caller, Alan Brooks had a great question in the chat that everyone's been arguing about. Ooh. Does Camden Brown have more touchdowns than Cam Coleman this year? No. I could – I don't know, Jeffrey. It's going to be close. I Okay, help me understand this. I, I could see them two on the field at the same time. Right. Okay. Is, it, I mean, is, that, is that – Yeah. Okay. Sure. But if they're rolling – all right, so here's the thing. Man, he might benefit from Cam Coleman being on the other side. That's what I'm saying. Are they rolling coverage Cam's way? And then where is Rivaldo Fairweather on the field? Because he's also going to take touches in the red zone away from both of those guys. It's an interesting question for sure. Man, I could probably argue it both ways. He's you way. had six to eight for Cam Coleman. Does Camden Brown, is that any higher? Is your projection any higher than six to eight this year? Who do we think is going to lead the team in touchdown receptions this year? Fairweather. Besides, besides Rafaldo. Over, ooh. Wide receiver wise, who's going to have the end up with the most touchdowns? Is it I going think... to be Camden Brown or Cam Coleman? Is it going to be. <clears throat> Robert Lewis, is it going to be? I think they're going to feed Cam. I'm going to be honest. That I, th- I think Cam's going to get more touchdown targets than Camden. 
I agree. That's why. I, that's why I went to Cam Coleman. I think he's going to have more opportunities. But man, but then you make a great point, Alan. If they're double teaming or shading the safety over here on Cam, what does that leave with Camden? I agree. I mean, if if they cheat the coverage and roll the safety to that side, and you got one on one to you know what I mean on a fade ball with an undersized corner, what are you going to do? And you got so you've got to respect Cam Coleman. You've got to respect Rivaldo Fair, Fairweather certainly in the red zone. And then you know whoever that third guy is, fourth guy, the slot then, you're going to have the slot, and you're going to have a, a, I guess a Z out on the outside if Cam's at the X. Yep, and if you get a decent pass set, like you said, you've got several big bodies down there. Plus, if you're running the RPO on that, you've got the running game. You got to account for Jared. Uh, not Jared Stidham. Excuse me, <laughs> Peyton Thorn. You wish. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. <laughs> um, Peyton Thorn also back there, who's got mobility in the red zone. So it's going to be interesting, man, to have that many big bodies down there that we just didn't have last year. I mean, you heard Ken Austin talk about it this week. Cole, you were there for the interview um, on the play that they repped for the Iron Bowl specifically. That was fantastic. When he hit VAR on the backside right in the face mask. Think about if that's a different receiver. If that's Cam Coleman in the back of the end zone, he's hitting him right in the middle of the numbers, not in the face mask, ball right? Ball game. As Ken Austin said, ball game. Yeah. Man, on paper, I've I said this, man, on paper, Auburn's offense, if you can find a damn quarterback, and I'm not saying they don't have one, but if you can see an in, uh, an upgrade at the quarterback position, whether that be Peyton Thorne upgrading his play from last year, the, on paper, this offense is probably the best on paper we've seen since Gus's 2019. Yeah, because who did you have in that lineup? You had Bo Nix at quarterback. Seth you Williams, had, Anthony Schwartz. Yeah. Seth and Anthony. And the difference is you had – those guys were, were vets. Okay, let's be fair. Your, your targets are going to be younger on the outside, but the running game probably is not going to be as good. I mean, it, it, I think our running game is better with Jarquez because you have Booby Whitlow in the backfield that year. It's, it's, it's a better, it's it's the a better room. Who was better that? Room. Shivers was oh, yeah. backup. Oh, and don't forget about Sean just absolutely taking somebody's soul that's, down there on the goal line. I forgot about that because one. I was at that game. It was um Xavier McKinney. Yeah, that's right. That's all. They, 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 put a, they put a cross up at the back of the end zone. <laughs> 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 Wasn't Cam Martin in that rotation too? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Cam Martin, Booby Whitlow, and Sean Shivers versus Jarquez Hunter, Demari Austin, Jeremiah Cobb. Yeah, give me this backfield for sure. Brian Bates. On paper, this could be fun to watch. All right, Zach. Good stuff, Kevin. Look at him. He got us talking for 20 minutes. Appreciate you, big dog. I believe we got Anthony here. Anthony, you're live. Fellas, fellas. What is up, Anthony? Anthony. How y'all doing tonight? Fairly well, Anthony. What's on your mind tonight, big dog? What you got for us? Hey, y'all know that was my question about the weird food commission, right? That was you? Yes. Was it really? Okay. Oh well, let's hear it. How about you, with, uh, Anthony? It it might not be weird, but I think it's some it's weird to some people. Mayonnaise on a hot dog. That's a weird. No, I, I, I go for that. I go uh, for that. I've, I've I've never heard that. That's not as bad as some of the other ones we've heard. Mayonnaise and peanut butter sandwich. Got to try it, Jay Lee. It's, it's good. Mayonnaise on. I mean, it sounds. No, nah, I mean, I put mayonnaise on there, but that's not all I put on there. I put a lot of things on there. Ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise. Kraut, onions, no, just, just mayonnaise. Just mayonnaise on a hot dog, and that's it. You got, you got to load it down, load it down the mayonnaise. Oh, oh Anthony, <laughs> you're talking to a guy that just puts spicy mustard on his man with a little bit of ketchup. Sometimes, if it's a hot dog, if it's a bratwurst, it's just the spicy, the spicy mustard and, and some onion. Uh, I can't do the mayonnaise, man. Mayonnaise that, on a hot dog, interesting. Just, just mayonnaise. I will, I will, I will give it a try because. I didn't think watermelon with the Tajin sauce, uh, salt. And listen, that, I want every watermelon without it. Yeah. Good All right. Tajin. Now you, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do y'all ever eat banana sandwiches or tomato sandwiches where it's like mayonnaise and then just sure. the tomato or the banana? Okay. I, don't do, I don't do banana, but yes, tomato. I used yes. to back in the day. Bro, my dad used to do some poor man's cooking and he'd go get a 
bucket of fried chicken and make a banana sandwich for us. Call it a king's meal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad was notorious for mayonnaise and tomato sandwiches. Yes. Uh, mayonnaise and pineapple sandwiches. Is that a weird combo? Little, but I, I can I can see it. Pineapple yeah. sandwich with mayonnaise. Uh, what, what was the other one? Banana. Banana and mayonnaise. Yeah. Maybe banana peanut butter. Yeah, when you guys were talking about like when when your wife was pregnant, Cole, when mom was pregnant, it was pineapple and ice cream Snickers bars, man. Like it was. Mm. I just got me some ice cream Snickers bars the other day. Did you? Another one That's she did. Say. She'd take one of them honey crisp apples and put peanut butter on it and then roll it in um, cocoa pebbles. Oh. Pretty good. Delicious. I won't be honest with you. I think it might be good. <laughs> yeah, my inner fat kid is coming out on hey, that. Well, sure. That's like something I'd like if I went out to Colorado and ate one of them gummies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, no <laughs> doubt, yeah. brother. A box of fruity pebbles, <laughs> some pineapples, some peanut butter, and some mayonnaise. Woo. <laughs> <Whew. laughs> Anthony, we took a wrong turn yeah. somewhere, All big right. dog. <laughs> Get us, reel us back in, Anthony. Hey, y'all stole my phone. My phone on my first question, so I'm going to switch it up. Okay. So, uh, let's get y'all talking. Robert Lewis or Jay Fair, who has the most offensive snaps? That's the first question. Okay. Mm. The second question is defensive snaps. Who has the most? Coach Hood or Tyler Scott? T. Scott versus Colton but, Hood. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, if, you, if you know where to start, it's tough for me. I, I know probably, where to start. Yeah, I know where to start on both, but go ahead. Okay, no, you go ahead. Colton Hood, I think that kid is going to be a playmaker. I have liked him since he committed to Auburn. Just love the kid's mindset uh, and everything I hear behind the scenes as far as how he attacks practice each and every day. I think I think he's going to be good for two picks this year. Um, At what position? Corner. Okay. And then maybe even some nickel. Um, I'm going to go with Robert Lewis in the slot. I think so, too. I'm going with Robert as well on that one. On, on defense, I'm going with Tyler Scott, and, and here's why. Uh, that's going to be close, by the way. That was a good, that was a good two. To, I agree. I, I, I think what you're seeing now or, or what you're reading on where guys are lining up is going to change a lot by the time we get to the season. Um. I don't think Colton Hood's going to play much nickel because I think Tyler Scott's a better fit for that, personally. I agree. Now, again, I don't know what they're going to do. This is what I'm looking at from actually getting to see full practices. Um, <clears throat> I think Tyler Scott's a head buster, mm -hmm. and he's fast, and he's big, and he's physical, and I like everything about Tyler Scott. <laughs> so I really do believe um, he's going to end up playing some nickel for Auburn. Um, but the key here is Champ Anthony is a guy that's not being talked about enough. I he's played nickel. I don't I like think he played kid. nickel. I think he's going to be a safety for Auburn. Watching his junior college tape, I would. I mean that that's what I thought he was, and then I was shocked that he played cornerback predominantly last year. So his move to safety frees up a few things. If does that make sense? What I'm saying. For it guys does. like Tyler Scott and Colton Hood, it puts them squarely in the two deep potentially. If if he moves to safety, and I, I think I think he's worked some there, nickel. I think he's done a lot, but I think he's going to be a true safety. That's my prediction. I don't know that for sure. It's my guess. Anthony's got me thinking here. Where do you guys think Sylvester Smith is? Is he at the nickel or is he back at a deep safety spot? <sighs> he can do both. I, I like him at both. I think he'll be a safety. Okay. Who's Smitty J? Who's Smitty J? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony. Is he so oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Okay, so I'm going with Robert Lewis because I've heard more about Robert Lewis. I don't know about the other two. Y'all know more than I do about those. I have no idea. So we'll, uh, I'll defer to y'all on that. Uh, but, man... <laughs> And maybe it's because you, the new guys are asked. You're asking more about the new guys, and I'm not because I'm not out there asking about Jay Fair. I'm out there going, "Hey man, what, what what's Robert Lewis look like?" Oh man, you know what I mean. Like, so I've heard more buzz about Robert Lewis, but uh, I've 
to be fair, I've asked about Robert Lewis. I haven't asked about Jay Fair. I've heard some buzz on Jay, and it sounds okay. like he's played well in spring so far. Are those your top two slot guys? In my opinion, yes. Okay. Cole, what do you think? Who, would, think, who, who uh, else is in the game here? Who else would are you considering? Bryce Kane Caleb, and Caleb Burton. Caleb Burton potentially. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But they've used Caleb some on the outside too, so I'm not sure how they plan to feature him. That's the question I have with him. Yeah. I, I think with with if Cameron Brown emerges like he should, then like he will. Caleb probably goes inside more often. That's my guess. Yeah. Um, I, I think for guys like Jay Fair, Mike O'Reilly, um, guys that have been in the – and it's not their fault. It just – it's – when they've been in the system for a minute, when they've been at Auburn for a minute, you question what's holding them back exactly. So it's a question that you ask naturally. It's not anything against them. It's not personal. You ask the question, what is holding them back? I, I, and I asked that question about them. So for that reason, with Robert Lewis now coming in, there's been a little bit of buzz around him. I've seen him. I think he's physical. I think he can play. Um, I, I'd pick him uh, because I do have just the smallest little concern about a guy like Jay Fair. You know, you've been there for a minute. What what has led to you not playing as much or being the playmaker that we think you can be? What I can't help but ask that question. I think the hard thing for me with Jay Fair is he, he disappeared down the stretch last year. And he made plays to start the season, and then somewhere mm-hmm. after A&M, it just – A&M, LSU game, it, it just was never the same after that for me, like watching Jay Fair play. And I know he made some plays against Arkansas and and maybe maybe Mississippi State, but it felt like Javaris Johnson took over as the predominant playmaker at that position. And – so I wonder if he's over his inconsistency because, Cole, you talked about it. It's not that he's not a playmaker with the ball in his hand. It's what happens pre-snap. It's what happens getting off the jam. Yep. Uh, let's see. Anthony's always Six, good. 9 four, zero. You're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is uh, Alex from Malta. I was just calling up. I had been wondering what you think the splits are going to be on the running back room. What do you think, Jarquez, Mari, and Kyle split the split the touches back there? And I also wanted to know what the running back and wide receiver rooms are looking like for the uh, twenty five class, or not the rooms, but the boards. Who do you think we're pushing the hardest for in those rooms? Love it, Alex, and very uh, well timed too, because Auburn has had their top running backs on campus in the past seven days. We'll go ahead and throw this out there. Uh, uh, um, Usman Koma, Koma, Chroma, yes. Chroma visited last weekend. Alvin Henderson visited last weekend. I think we all agree those are their top two guys on the board right now, and they're not going to go to number three until. Well, I think you get one of those. Alvin's going to announce. I think maybe in April. I think he said. Mm-hmm. Usman Chroma. Uh, he didn't give a timeline, but you've got Georgia, Florida State, and and another school pressing right there for him. So you've got some high competition. And, on him, and then obviously a Kylan Deer who was here this past week. Hey, yes, right. yeah. So that's your top three in three, my yeah, opinion. no doubt. And if you want to add a fourth, DeWan Morris was here not too long ago too. So DeWan. all of those guys, those guys have all been on campus for a reason. They're they're top guys at this at the running back position, and they want to. So I'd keep and I'd keep you know tabs on those four. And they all visited in the last eight days. Wide receiver room. Cortez Mills was here last weekend. I think he's up there in the uh, – Caleb Cunningham's coming in this weekend. Mm-hmm. Travis Smith was supposed Travis to Smith. come in, but I, I think he's already scheduled an official visit. So you He's know, coming he's this weekend. One. Is he coming this weekend? So Caleb, okay. C- Caleb Cunningham and Travis Smith both will be here on Saturday. Cortez Mills was here last Saturday. Who's the kid from Milton? Um, from uh, yeah, C.J. Wiley. Yes, yeah, C.J. C. Wiley. Wiley has he's visited. been here. Mm-hmm. Derek yeah. Smith is still in there. Very much involved. The young man from Carver. Oh, yeah. T.K. Norman. T.K. Norman. Yep. Uh, Dylan Upshaw, who's been here a couple different times. I know that it, some national guys have reported that Miami is going to be hard to beat there. They seem to be the team that's pressing the hardest with him. But <clears> if Auburn turns up the heat there, I got to think they're going to be squarely in the mix with him. You know, we, we've, we've said, even going back to February, when we're, we're trying to put these – 
list together, man, Marks will tell us so much on where what Auburn's board looks like at these positions. And we've seen those four running backs come in in the past eight, nine days. These wide receivers are all coming in. We know and, – and, and what's great about being up there and being around it is we get to see the how they treat these guys. Right. And, and, and usually that tells you kind of what – how big of a priority. Um, Agreed. And this is not meant to be a shot at anybody. I'm using this purely as an example, but I saw where BOL, like in January as a talking piece, did a mock class. And I don't even understand how you could get there without seeing March and how these kids visit and who's prioritized and then kind of who they're going to go see in April. Like that would be the earliest I could absolutely roll something out and tell you for sure. Like, Hey man, with any level of legitimacy, this is, this is what I think is possible in this class. Because like you said, you just talked about it, who they prioritize. There are a lot of kids they offer. you got a massive board of like 200 prospects you're trying to trim down to somewhere around 75 that you're really looking at going into their senior year. Alex, I, I love the, the first part of his question. At the end of the year, fellas, when we look at the running back carries, and it's a total of, I don't know, X amount. What percentage will Jarquez have of those total carries? What percentage will Damari have? What percentage will will um, twenty three have? JC, we'll we'll start with those three. Are we talking seventy, fifteen, and fifteen? Uh, what are we talking about here? What do y'all think at the end of the day? Who's getting? What, what is your percentage of total carries by running backs at the end of the year? I think that's the best way we could do it. So mm. you've got. Jarquez is definitely at least 60, wouldn't you say? I'm going to go 50. Oh, so he's getting one out of two carries. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be – I think they're going to roll a good rotation this year. I'm going to go Jarquez with 50% of the carries. And then 25-25 or 30-20 and 20 maybe? 30-20 and 20 is what I got. Because I think Damari's earned carries. I mean, I saw – I do too. I, I honestly believe, and Cole talked about, he's got the best vision of the entire backfield. I believe that. And if he stays healthy, I think he would have gotten closer to that percentage if he doesn't blow his shoulder out this past year because he was on a roll up until that A&M game. Now, granted, Jarquez was also not playing his best football at that point either. He was a little rusty for obviously having not participated, I think, in offseason conditioning with the rest of the team um, and was just kind of getting a feel for getting back into football. So that probably played a part in it. But I, I think Damari's a leader on this team, and he's earned carries. For that reason, I'm going 50% Jarquez Hunter, 40% Damari Austin, and 10% Jeremiah Cobb. And here's – hear me out. We're talking about carries. Yeah. Not oh, – I, I hear you. Touches, not touches. Not touches. Now, if you want to go touches, I might go 15% for Cobb. I think that's as high as I'm going to go, and here's why. We can all look at the running back room and go, now, Jer Jeremiah Cobb might be the most talented. Yeah. Anybody can look at that. You don't have to know a lot about football to realize he brings something a little bit different to the table. But something that really good running back coaches understand, and I think Derek Nix is one of those, is it doesn't matter how talented you are. Do you maximize the yardage on your carries? That's yeah. the bottom line. That could be yards after contact. That could be you saw a hole where there wasn't one. You you were patient and you found the right place because when you're running zone stuff, the offensive line doesn't have to be perfect. The running back does. You know that, right, Zach? <laughs> yeah. Offensive line just got to be sound. They ain't got to kill them. They don't have to throw somebody 10 yards off the ball. Just be sound, and then the back will make it happen. Right. Create a lane. Stay with and your I side. Think, I think Damari Austin and Jarquez Hunter are so far advanced in that, and they've had years of it now, a couple years behind their belts. Jarquez more than Damari. Damari more than Cobb. They're going to get the majority. Does that make sense? 45, 35, 20. I think, like you say, 45, 35, and 20. Okay. And here, here's why. Just as Damari has earned carries, I feel like Jeremiah has too. One out of every five. 
is what I'm what I'm projecting here. It sounds a lot though. That sounds like a lot. Well, yeah, but think about the all right. So you're gonna have some games where you're blowing people out and he's gonna get 10, yeah, 12 right. carries. You know what I mean? So the it may not necessarily like the sequencing in game for SEC games may not feel that way, but you know, if you get up on Cal or you get up in some of these other non-con games, you're absolutely going to get Jeremiah get some touches. And then I, I'm with Cole. I think he's probably your best pass receiver out of the backfield or most natural anyway. Do they get him one or two catches a game in crucial yeah. moments and spots uh, where you where you have something designed yeah. for him? And just think about what we talked about here. We talked about these three, and we didn't mention Brian Batty at all. What does that mean? I mean, like we we talk about attrition post spring. Yeah, is he a guy that is feeling some pressure and decides to enter the portal post spring? And that's what you don't know. I mean, I, I don't think anybody wants to pontificate on that. But I think about the rundown we just did and the percentages that we allotted, and not one of those was for Brian Batie. Mm-hmm. He's just yeah. a return specialist right now, right? That's the main value he supposedly brings, and. I don't think he really brought that all American level over last year in that aspect. Yeah. I hate to do that to him too, because man, he had some really nice runs for Auburn last year and, and receptions and plays. It wasn't in the return game so much, but go back and watch the Georgia game, the AM game. He he went off a couple of times. Uh, he's he's pretty, he's a good running back. It, that's 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 how good this running back room is. If nothing else, though, what is it? Shit, what it tells me is you cannot afford to skip recruiting a position each and every year because of who's going to enter the portal. If we had a freshman coming in in this class, you're still sitting five deep, even if Brian Batie enters the portal. <clears throat> yeah. If he and doesn't, don't forget about Sean Jackson, man. From what I heard, he went off the other day. Look, Sean Jackson. If you end up with Sean Jackson in the rotation, I guarantee you he's going to make plays with the football. I firmly believe. I like it. that kid. I think they do too. I mean, yep. he's just he's buried behind three other really good running backs. That's the problem. Mm, good stuff, well, Alex. Well, you talk about like the auxiliary stuff a running back has to do with patience, making those plays, but they might not be the most talented. The guy that when you say that comes to mind in terms of Auburn running backs is Booby Whitlow. Mm, I think yep. he's probably you probably wouldn't put him in the top ten most talented running backs since 2000 for Auburn, but he always seemed to make those extra plays in the big games. I think of the first down run against Bama in 2019 where he broke like two or three tackles to get that late yeah. first down run. He always seemed to make plays. That A&M t- game-winning touchdown run in, what was it, 2018 or 19? Um, I forget which year that is, but Booby Whitlow is who I think of when you say that because he's definitely not the most talented running back Auburn had, but he yeah. always seemed to make the big plays. I and agree. One, one other thing that I, that got me thinking, pass pro, um, and and the mm. value of a running back in the mm. passing game. If we're going to run pace at all, then you're going to have less sub on the running back, and they're going to stick with the guy who's good in pass protection. Yeah. So oh. it, that that also could change who's in the game and who's getting carries. I also believe that garbage time is not as much of a thing as it used to be with the new clock rules. Agreed. Um, especially if you're trying to um, fight to win some of these games, if, if you're offering uh, games that you should win pretty easily. But you, you know how it goes. Um, yeah, I'm with you, Zach. Booby was that guy. The one that comes to mind for me is Carrion Johnson. I thought that oh. dude, he was the epitome to me of somebody who's probably going to go run a 4-6 or something like that in the combine, not going to wow anybody. But he was going to get the most out of every single touch he got, every time. And that is, there's nothing that there's. I don't care if you're Bo Jackson. If somebody can figure out how to get a better, uh, you know, yards per average carry, whatever, than Bo Jackson, they're going to play over Bo Jackson. That's how that works. You talk about zone run scheme, how patient Carry On was, and how he could press the line of scrimmage and see the hole open and just. You know what I mean? Absolutely hit it. And like you said, maximize the yards. I mean, he was fantastic that year um, at, at doing that. That's for sure. A great example, and we'll move on. As talented as Tank Bigsby was, he didn't maximize his carries all the time. Hmm. Try to hit the home run too much. And sometimes he did. 
but I'll a lot of times it. he did not. A Cameron Artist Payne had Ooh. a more productive oh, yeah. career yeah. than Tank Bigsby. Tank Bigsby was miles more talented, in my opinion, than Agreed. Cameron Artist Payne was. Agreed. I love Cam. I love Cap. Yep. Good stuff, Alex. Appreciate you, big dog. One last caller. Five nine eight three. You're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? Five nine eight three. You're live. Hey guys. What's happening, big dog? Steve Valentine. Steve Valentine from Stanford, North Carolina. Who's oh, Steve? Steve Valentine. Yes, sir. From hey, NC. I know y'all can't go wrong with some fresh flounder with some Parmesan Italian breadcrumbs and some good old honest butter. Oh. That's oh, not a weird combination at all. That's, that oh, that sounds delicious. Sounds like. That's delicious. That's delicious. <laughs> Fish and grits in the morning now. Yep. That'll eat. Steve, is, uh, are, are you from the East Coast of North Carolina? Man, I'm originally from Foley, Alabama. I moved up here. What so part of North Carolina? I'm in uh, North Carolina currently. Yeah. I was talking over him. Now, I have a question for y'all. All right. How long until we can expect Coach Cadillac Williams to come back and be our head coach? I would not hold your breath. I don't think I would that's... say five to ten years, man. Oh, no. <sighs> That's not. I don't. I, that's not happening. I mean, maybe, but if it works out like it's supposed to, you won't. You freeze a bit, Auburn, in five to ten years. This is the thing with I'm Cadillac. Five years. I'm hoping within ten we see Coach Caddy come back. I think he's got big things in our future. I'm hoping he comes back. What, Steve? Why do you want Cadillac to be the head coach at Auburn? I just think the positivity he brought to the program, and you know how we had the players and the fan base behind him all the way. I think Coach Hugh Freeze is a stepping stone to get us back to where we need to be. And I believe that he's going to be the one that brings us back to our glory that we're looking for. I understand their sentiment, but he has besides a, a cheerleader last year of, of, of getting everybody back on the same page. And it, listen, that wasn't a, a difficult job because everybody was so split and harsen. The fan base was, the, it wasn't even divided. Everybody was pretty much anti. So that kind of like gave everybody a reason. He was a, a lightning rod for hope last year for positivity, exactly. but he has no experience running a college football program. Zero. He doesn't well, know how to set up. Right. That's what he's working on now. He's a running backs coach in the NFL. He's not doing anything college related. I just, uh, I, I, I just hate to burst your bubble, man. But that, that's just not happening. Well, if, to, looking, if you were looking for an alum to come and be head coach in the future, once you guys look at T. Rob before anybody, Kim or Zach Evans, I feel like they both by good uh, chemistry to everybody, as far as the fan base and the you know players. I think it'd be exciting for him to come back. To be honest. And it would be until he lost three in a row and then everybody would turn on him. And that, that's the thing. It, when you talk about hiring an if alumni. You, if you lose three in a row, anybody's going to turn on you. <laughs> possibly. But you think about the legacy that Carnell Williams has right now, right? Like how he's remembered. What happens? And, and you saw this firsthand. Mike Shula, who had zero head coaching experience, come back to the University of Alabama. And to this day, I know people that are Alabama fans and that know, you know what I mean, like that are aware of that situation. Shula will not come back to Tuscaloosa with the way that ended. Like it absolutely ruined that relationship between him and the university. And to me, that's what you're looking at with Carnell because he hasn't now at this point. Now, what happens if he goes off and he becomes a head coach at a lower level and he really develops and gets into his bag and understands that there's, you know, what I mean, there are so many different moving parts to running a program as a head coach right now. When it comes to setting up a recruiting department, to to fundraising, to being able to delegate amongst coordinators, all those moving pieces that Hugh Freeze has already done. And I'm not saying this to prop up Hugh Freeze. I'm talking about any head coach. There needs to be a training ground before walking into a position like Auburn, where you're on the biggest stage and the biggest lights, 
and you understand how all the moving pieces work and the political aspect of being a head coach in the SEC in addition to all of that. So to me, Carnell, just he needs to mature beyond just being a running backs coach. And I know it's the next step up in the NFL, but that's not necessarily preparing him to be a head coach. That is teaching him more about the game of football, in my opinion. That's where you get your Ph.D. in football. But that's not necessarily managing a team, a roster, recruiting departments, everything else. Right. NIL. Five to ten years. I think he'll be back. I honestly do. Okay. So, you, you you hope not though, because if five to ten years Auburn's looking for a new head coach, then Hugh Freeze has failed. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Steve, what do you think of the job Hugh Freeze is doing so far at Auburn? Just curious. As far as recruiting goes, I think he's doing great. I really do. I think he uh, is doing good as far as preparing the guys for the next year, and he's doing good as far as you know preparing for the years after that. And I'm excited about it, and I look forward to seeing what he's going to do in our future as far as this year and the next few years. And I hope he brings the excitement that Carnell did to the fan base, even though it was temporarily. But I just, for some reason, I feel like Caddy will be back in our near future, and I think he's going to be on his vengeance, and I think he'll be prepared. Okay. I hear you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna swallow my tongue. Well, I, I'm, I'm laughing at what I was gonna say, like at, at a head over here. <laughs> They're like a heads. Everybody's got one opinions. Yeah, I mean, his is just as justified as anybody else's. Uh, sure, uh, agreed. Steve. Agreed. And, and I, just disagree, like... I, dis- I disagree with you. That doesn't mean you're wrong. And I'm with you on the T-Rob aspect of it, Zach. You're talking about a guy that's done the work. You know what I mean? Defensive coordinator now at Georgia, been in, you know, on different high-level staffs, and is truly – he's preparing himself at this point to take that next step of being a head coach someplace. Do you think he would be at the top of the list if, say, in three years, Auburn's looking for a new head coach? I'm with you, Zach. I mean, hey, listen, he's he's – He's just as qualified as Will was. Correct. He's just as qualified as Kirby is. Was. And what just as qualified as Dan Lanning was. Dan Lanning. Yeah. Steve Kenny Sarkeesian. Kenny Dillingham. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, you Eli think, Drinkwitz. Correct. Even though I guess Eli did get that one stint at Appalachian State. So he yeah, had a little right. bit of he had a That's little bit of a leg that. up. You're right. If you're going that way, I mean, even Del McGee would be on my list higher than him personally because because let's say he goes to georgia state wins the sun belt two or three years and let's just say in four or five years auburn has an opening he's a two three times sun belt champion all the history at auburn all the history in the sec of recruiting why wouldn't you go and get del, del mcgee potentially oh, i agree because you're talking about head coach experience at two different levels at the high school ranks as well as at the in, at the college ranks now the only thing that gives me pause about hiring a head coach from the G5 level right now is how different the demand is, specifically in the NIL world um, and the transfer portal and the limited connections you make right now at the G5 level. And I'm not saying that it balls any different. It's not. You're still learning how to administer and run a program, which is invaluable experience. But if you're talking about recruiting relationships as you roll into the door, I'm much more apt to hire a coordinator at this point that's been at a high level and been in a high-end recruiting operation of what's current day P5 football. So in like, three because years, the, yeah, the landscape's changing so much every day right now. Three years, Hugh Freeze wins two natties at Auburn. He leaves for the NFL. Okay. Who are your top three guys on your list? Ooh. Knowing what we know now, not in three years, just what we have right now. If we've elevated to that point, we're probably not picking coordinators. You're probably picking active head coaches, but T Rob would be on my short list for interview for sure. sure. So you think uh, the only way you elevate a coordinator from another SEC uh, school, whatever, would be when you're on the come up, not peaking? So it's hard to say because I think fit has to matter. And I I know Cole's going to hammer this. You you know what I mean? 
there is a time though that you think about Alabama coming off multiple national championships. Mm-hmm. They had elevated themselves to the point that they could cherry pick an active head coach. Now, I'll be honest, I think they had conversations with multiple other targets beyond the one they settled on, regardless of what's been reported. I don't, I mean, I think Kalen DeBoer was high on their list, don't get me wrong, but I think they talked to at least two or three other sitting head coaches to get a feel of what they were going to do. Lanning being one. Lanning being one, I think obviously there was a poison pill built into his contract. I mean, you were going to have to eat Nike money upon his buyout. So that was never going to happen. I think they had conversation with Steve Sarkeesian to see if he'd be interested in leaving Texas. Probably kicked the tires on Norvell, even though I think DeBoer was higher on the list than him. Um, but there was a chance that they were going to get beyond that. And then where were they going to go? I mean, who who were you going to were you going to go? Are you really going to hire Lane Kiffin? And I think he's a phenomenal head coach. Don't get me wrong. I think Lane Kiffin is a fantastic play caller, probably one or top one or two play callers in all of college football. But were you really going to hire him? No. No. So then you're starting to look, okay, who are the high-end coordinators that we could potentially hire in that position? Hmm. Well, Steve, if nothing else, big dog, you got us talking. No, it was great. It was a great topic. But I do think even if Cardell were to go out, I think Zach makes a great point. There's still going to be guys higher on the list than him, more qualified, even with Auburn ties. Um. Yeah, probably even the other defensive coordinator that's at Georgia right now. I mean, you got T. Rob as one. Schumann. Yeah, Glenn Schumann would absolutely be on my short list of somebody that I have, I would want to talk to. Uh, who else elevates them? Eli Drinkowitz would be on my list of somebody I would want to talk to that knows Auburn specifically. Um. And then there's Ooh. you got a factory in price point too, right? Because you got to pay somebody else's buyout. That's the other aspect of it too. And, and we just talked about Dan Lanning. I mean, Dan Lanning would be a sh- slam dunk of who I'd want to talk to, but would he leave Oregon to come to Auburn? Well, the good thing is, is that somebody would have to pay Hugh Freeze's buyout to Auburn. Sure would. So you'd have some extra. It'd be the first time. Scenario. Yeah, in this scenario, it'd be the first time Auburn's not paying multiple buyouts to get head coaches. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, and if Gus is coming off, you know, a couple of playoff runs. Oh man! Oh, this... Hey, hey now, <laughs> hey now! And I thought I was low thinking because I was thinking Mike Loxley, who just beat Auburn to death at Maryland, if he gets Maryland trending in the right direction like he has. You know what? Lox is a really underrated head coach in my he honest is. opinion. Maryland I is like a him. hard ass job. It is a hard job. Um, the Brom guy at Louisville. I, I would absolutely have a conversation with Jeff Brom. I think he's an elite play caller. Um, I think that, I think a conversation has been had with Jeff Brom before. I think you're right. I'm, there yeah, it I mean, is. I was going to say, that's not the first time I've heard his name mentioned in Auburn head coaching circles. No. Um, would you go down the Lane Kiffin route? Would you go no, back I'm on that one again? <laughs> I think there are some people that feel the same way as you. <laughs> nope. That, that <laughs> ship has sailed. I think <laughs> um, uh, Mike Norvell is the one that keeps coming to mind, but I, I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I feel pretty certain you could probably go back to one of our shows before freeze was hired. And I said, freeze. You did. The guy I wanted to see at Auburn. Cause I just feel like it's a good fit. And that, that rules to me. It just does. I, I fully expect Hugh freeze to be at Auburn in 10 years. And I, I agree. Like, I feel like he's played for – I think he's going to be a, a perennial playoff. He's going to have Auburn as a perennial playoff team. I, I would be – would you be more shocked if in 10 years Hugh Freeze has or hasn't won a national championship at all? <laughs> you saw the comment too, Cole. You see what I see? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's currently the coach at Arkansas State? The funny, oh, that's a good isn't one. Isn't it Butch? That's funny. Butch no, Jones? It, it, yeah, but we're not hiring brick. We're not hiring brick by brick. That's not <laughs> happening, man. Um, because Auburn has only won one in the modern era, Jeffrey. I'm going to say, now, let's. If you change that to playoff, I think he's made multiple playoffs. Has he won a national championship? I don't know. I think he's recruiting at a national championship type level, but you also have to have some good breaks as it pertains to scheduling, some good fortune in the playoff now. There's a lot that's going to be layered into that. You're not talking about a, two games you got to win anymore. It's it's more. I think you got to win what four games to yeah. win a national championship now. Unless you get a bye. Unless you get a bye, and then it's three. 
Here, so, here's two, let me bounce two more names off of y'all real quick. Mike Elko. Not yet. Depends. I, I, I think he would be tough to pull out of A and M because they'd be willing to pay whatever. All right, now here's the here's the interesting one to me. Rhett Lashley. That's one. Okay, mm. I'm gonna be honest with you because Rhett's done really good work at SMU. Does that continue on? Does that continue on? Because um, they're moving to the ACC this year, right? Correct. So if he does it at the Power Five level at SMU, that changes the conversation. I think it absolutely changes the calculus. Not for me. For it. That's Gus two point for me. As much as I do like this hypothetical, I just wrote a whole story on <laughs> on what I've seen from Hugh Freeze so far and why I like it. So uh, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but no, I, I think the thing that you love about Freeze is a the fit. He fits with the Auburn fan base. He fits with the money people, okay, and the experience at Ole Miss, okay. He's learned so much from being in a power five seat, and you think about how advantageous that is to this situation, particularly in some place that can be as political as Auburn. And let's not let's let's call a spade a spade here, okay. Auburn is a place where you got to be a little political, man. You got to be willing to especially in the NIL game today with those people that are funding your team. If things don't change and you don't get some kind of collective bargaining agreement where you're able to siphon off some of the TV NIL money, like if that doesn't happen, how closely you are with it and how good you are at fundraising is going to be as big a skill set as anything. I think Hugh Freeze understands that aspect of it, and that is an invaluable trait in a head coach in today's game. How old is Hugh? Does anybody know? 53. So maybe 15 more years, maybe, right? Yeah, I mean, I I think once you get north of 60 in today's game, you're starting to check the – you're reevaluating every year. Once you get north of 60, do I really want to do this? Man, it's going to be so – college football is going to be so top-heavy. I mean, the money, Ohio State – US. look what USC did this just weekend alone with all these commitments. They flipped five-star Justice Terry – from freaking yeah. Georgia. And listen, all this momentum, people are buying this momentum. Hey, great. Hey, it's completely legal. But, you know, it, the, the the rich are getting richer, right? Oh, yeah. I agree completely. Now, I think Justice Terry is going to flip back to Georgia before it's all said and done. I, I, think, I got 20 bucks that says he does. Yeah, because <laughs> I think USC is going to get absolutely smashed in the Big Ten this year. Because yeah. they got, what, all four of their commits are from Georgia right now? Yeah. Because oh, Julian uh, Lewis, Justice Terry, they landed the other four star today out of who, Georgia. He visited Auburn, Cole. Hil- Hilton Stubbs. Yes. Drake. Uh, yeah, he's out of Florida. Yeah, Drake. No. He goes, Drake is his uh his first name's Hilton, but he goes by and Drake. I tell you what, this on Cole, this is a good learning experience. Drake Stubbs, I think I was the only one who did that, but he was one of those he was fired up when he left Auburn. He that's why. I, that's the main reason I retweeted on Twitter. Like, um, not to say I didn't see that one coming because I don't play that game anymore. You, there's just going to be crap like that that happens, man. With 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 how it goes, but he was, uh, yeah, sounded like he was Auburn was going to be in it, and I still think Auburn will be in it. I was yeah. thinking about Isaiah Gibson out of Warner Robins. There you he go. committed to oh, USC today. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who visited Auburn? I think two weeks ago. Look, uh, look at USC's defense. It was the downfall of them last year, and uh, they're going to make some moves they, trying to get the defense better. They well, went and hired a great DC. They went and got the guy from UCLA. They went and got North Dakota State's head coach to be the linebackers coach and passing game coordinator. They loaded up the defensive coaching staff. And Doug Belk, who's the pull on those kids from Georgia, uh, who mm. was the defensive coordinator at Houston, but Doug's highly connected in South Georgia. Um, is their cornerbacks coach or secondary coach, one of the two. I can't remember the exact title on him, but it, I just – what I know is that trajectory also plays into this, and Georgia will find the NIL money for kids that they really want in their class. And there's nobody that puts the screws on a kid like Kirby Smart. I mean, he he's going to recruit – Yeah, he's going to recruit the whole family, and he's going to know exactly who the play caller is in that recruitment. Yes. Bank on that. If you don't, if the, if the people that are listening to the show right now, if they don't believe anything else I said tonight, if they should walk away and say, Alan's full of shit, and I could be, bank <laughs> on the fact that Kirby Smart knows exactly who the play caller and the recruitment is, and he's going to work that person. I've seen it. Oh, yeah. 
time and time again. Yeah. So sure. true or false before Hugh Freeze retires, leaves Auburn, he will win a national championship. I know he's going to, I think he's going to play for one. Is he going to win one? I'll, all right. I'm going to be the person to say yes. I'm going to be the person that says, yes, he, he wins a national championship. Just one before he leaves. Whatever that looks like. I think he's going to have Auburn perennial contenders in the playoffs in three to four years. And he will absolutely win a national championship. Before his I think time he, is done. I think he could. Again, it's so dicey, man, because of the yeah. playoff. It changes the dynamics it's, so much. Okay, now is football more? Is it is it tougher to win in football than it is in basketball now, or will it be in football? I, I think, think it's, it's always always been harder, in my opinion, just because in basketball, with the tournament, all it takes is for one player to get hot. It takes one guy on your team to get hot, like the kid off the bench from what was it Oakland. Going for 40 one night, and you can beat anybody in the country. Football, you have to have that consistency all year long. And also, one loss up until recently has taken you out of the national championship conversation. Do, does the playoffs open it up, though? It opens up the opportunity for a team that we typically be favored on perception. Okay. Yeah. So you think about this whole situation with Florida State and Alabama this past year. Alabama probably wins that game head up against Florida State, but you don't know that either. So it creates opportunity for other schools to have to have a chance to settle it on the field. And how many times has – I mean, think about the BCS alone. Auburn got absolutely jobbed that year. Mm -hmm. There is no way Oklahoma should have played in that national championship game over us, the team that we had. But in the algorithm that they had put together – they weighted some of the wins that Oklahoma had over some, how should I say, toothless Big 12 teams more so than a conference SEC conference championship that I'll still never understand. But it is what it is on that one. But Auburn should have absolutely had the opportunity to settle on the field. And I think had they done that, they had an opportunity to do exactly what Texas did, which is take USC down to the wire. That, that's Just the key to me, Alan. That's yeah. the key to me uh, with a playoff. That's why I'm so adamant about a playoff because I don't want some guys that sit in an office to make that decision. I want them to settle it on the field. And, and the same in basketball. Okay, I got, I'm with you, Zach. A guy gets hot, and that is kind of annoying because you know Kentucky's a better basketball team than Oakland. Yeah. But Auburn's they weren't that day. Team. Yeah, Auburn's a better basketball team than Yale, except for when we turn it over six times. My, you know what I mean? And yeah, Katie Johnson right. runs down the court without forgetting the basketball. Well, my advice to Kentucky and Auburn would be, you better bring it that day. Yeah. Figure it out because that's how it needs to work, in my opinion. A lot of people disagree with me, and that's totally fine. I love a playoff. Yeah, they, they get to settle it. The players get to settle it, not a, a guy, a, a goober in the office. No, Dubes. and I think – How many teams this year in 2024? 12. 12. It's going to be – it goes to 14, I think. It, well, they haven't settled that deal. Yeah, it, it's not official. They're thinking about 14, like two years from now. But this year is it's done, 12. Yes, 12 is this year. For the next four two buys. years is 12. Yeah. yeah. So it's four buys, and then you got the first round, <laughs> which uh, the, the first round will also be played on, 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 um, on campus. That's what I'm talking about. I can't wait for that. Can you that imagine, is... like, Penn State, Bama, oh, yeah, at great. either Brian Denny or, like, or, or another whiteout in Beaver Stadium, that's going to be electric. Think about the first playoff game in Jordan-Hare and how absolutely just electric that environment's going to be. That's worth six and a half points just before they even kick it off. And if okay. you don't believe me, ask Georgia and Alabama if Jordan-Hare yes. in an absolute lit environment's not worth six and a half to seven points. Mm, yes. We it's play those games. Game. Yeah, we play those games in Athens or Tuscaloosa this past year. I guarantee you we get our ass kicked by 14 plus yeah. points. <laughs> that that yep. was being generous. I yeah. Yeah. Agree. <laughs> like 14 yeah. is very generous for what Georgia. Yeah, maybe was Auburn as. scores a late touchdown to make it yeah. 14. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know the what? Kickoff or something. I will say this. There I've seen uh, in the past year or two, and this will be controversial too. It's all right. Dominance. Hot takes. Go for it. I don't see dominance anymore in sports. Teams don't know how to win consistently, really. Georgia, 
I thought they were going to be dominant. They lost. What happened to dominance? Even Alabama, who's been dominant all these years, they weren't dominant this year. What happened to it? Anybody, I, it's, it's, gotten more, it's gotten more all over the map. Like anybody can beat anybody on any given day. Yeah, that's always been true. I'm seeing a lack of dominance. Can we define dominance, though? Are we only saying dominance is national championship? Because if so, you might be right. But when you look across the conferences, if you take like three, five-year stints, I feel like the same teams have dominated. Like, But every like f- three to five years, it switches. But you still have dominance at the conference level, maybe not nationally because the parity has increased a little bit. It might be Michigan one year, Georgia, Bama, LSU, and Auburn comes in 2010. But historically, in five-year stints, the same teams are dominant. And then it flips once the next recruiting cycle kind of goes. Hmm. I so, would agree with that, Zach. And yeah. also, I'm just nodding. Go ahead. I was just going to say, all Georgia didn't dominate on the field in certain games the way that they did the year prior. But to me, if that's a playoff this year, I would have picked Georgia to win the whole thing. I think right. Alabama caught them on the right day at the right time with certain situations. Brock Bowers wasn't 100%. You play that game again, and I'm taking Georgia 10 out of 10. I mean, I and I think Georgia was better than than Michigan. I think if Michigan plays mm-hmm. the game, the style of game they want to play against Georgia, that is just teed up for the way Kirby wants to play in a phone booth, dude. Yeah. And I think you're probably talking about three national championships in three straight years. And to me, that that's dominant, regardless of how it looked on the field. And I'm with you, Cole, because they definitely look more vulnerable this year than the previous years. Maybe maybe dominant is not the right word. Uh, I'm I'm pointing toward. A roster to the to the extent of what Georgia was this year versus a roster to the extent of what Auburn was this past year. There ain't no way Auburn should have a chance, and they sure did have a chance. And so Georgia not dominating them. That's no, happened it's... before. That's not something new, but it seems to be happening more is what I'm trying to say. Is it the parity amongst coaches? I think the transfer portal is a big part of it, if yeah, I'm being honest. I agree. I agree. It's, it's eaten the depth of these teams that used to be able to stack talent. Yep. The same same with Auburn and New Mexico State. They New Mexico yeah. State had no business winning that game. And there I will use the word they dominated that game against Auburn. Yeah. Let me ask you guys a question. Since we're we're talking big picture right now, if they move to an employment model, I mean we're, we're already in an employee model. We're just not calling it that right now, right? But say we move to a full-scale employee model where you have contracts, revenue share. Um, Do they scale down the rosters to more something similar to NFL? And if they do that, how much does that increase parity? Because if you're only, say, able to pay 60 guys, now that's another 25 guys that used to be on somebody's roster that were high, that was high-end talent, right? Yeah. How does that change the math as it pertains to everybody else, and how does that filter out? Mm. Because I do think that you're going to shrink roster size to be able to pay all these guys. I don't think there's any way you're going to be able to pay 85 the way some people are presently being compensated. Why? How was how was Auburn able to stay in it with Georgia and Alabama? Besides home field. I is think that, or is that the sole reason? I think it well. A, I think the money's changed some things somewhat. I think kids are not necessarily. It's harder to get them motivated. And then I think the grind of a season. It's hard to get up and play on emotion the way you need it's, to. It's motivation, but I can't figure out why the motivation's not there exactly. And I don't want to just make assumptions. But there's no way Auburn should be running over Georgia's defensive line, but they did. And they shouldn't I mean, be doing that to Alabama either, and they did. I honestly think with Georgia, you saw a lot of, and this is just coming from me watching them throughout the year. You saw a lot of complaint of complacency, which is hard to get college kids focused. But guys, they were on like a thirty game win streak. I agree. Do you know how hard it is to get kids locked in? Like it, Kirby's got to go in that locker room and convince them that Vandy can beat them on Saturday, and they're like, "We've won thirty games, coach. Two natties. We've been number one for sixty straight weeks. They can't beat us." And I think that Bama game 
kind of woke them up. And you saw what happened when they really lock in, even with the, uh, I don't care about the opt-outs at Florida State. That was going to happen. Regardless if Keon Coleman played, regardless if the backup quarterback was healthy, you saw what Georgia could be. I think a lot of coaches have to fight complacency now because uh, how do you get a kid locked in every week to play every single team 12 13 games on the schedule well you see that in the nfl right and those guys are paid professionals getting them motivated week in week out so i mean oh, much less it's, get... it's, it's not incentive based they're they're controlling the money if if you're good enough you tell the university what you're going to be paid not the other way around and there's no incentive for that. All right, I got my money. I'm good. You dropped a bag on me. I don't, I, there's no incentive for me to be good or bad. And I can leave whenever I want to. Now, that's the thing. And this is where when we talk about we're in a pro model and, and where I get so agitated at some of the national people that talk about this on a, on a daily basis. Um where they talk about how coaches can leave. So why can't kids? And I, I think that's a fair point, right? But I think these coaches also have buyouts. And I think these coaches also weren't earning the kind of money that they're earning right now when they were 18 years old. And it's a completely different situation. Right. So if you're going to be able to earn money, and I think you should be able to earn money. I think it is your God-given right to be able to be paid for what you're good at. I also believe there should be certain levels of regulation that if you're going to take a paycheck from somebody, you have to honor a contract. That's how it works. In every, it, I'm in the military. I sign a contract, and by God, the United States government holds me to it, right? Mm -hmm. That's how it works. But in today's football, you're able to sign an NIL contract with a collective where it's completely unenforceable because it's not coming through the school. So there's no way to hold it, to hold you to it. So if you transfer, technically that collective can hold your rights if they want to continue to pay you, but who wants to pay somebody on somebody else's roster? So it's just, it, it's a hard, a hard situation right now to wrap your head around if you're a college head coach, but back to the original question. <laughs> I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> I don't know where we were. We're, we're so far away from that now, right? I, I think it was we were talking about dominance because we were we were on Cole's point. I think you're going to see dominance, but I think people have to adjust their expectation of what dominance looks like. I think winning national championships or multiple playoff appearances, but undefeated seasons because of the number of helmet games you're about to play year in and year out, because the SEC is going to go to a nine-game model. And then what happens if we expand? Do you increase that even more? Somebody's got to take the L at some point. So your adjustment to what dominance looks like has to change, or it, 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 at least it's to me it would be a reasonable expectation for it to change. Anyway. Our, our guy, Decone, I think has the better word, consistency. That, that's what more so what I'm talking about. We're, there, there's not a consistently – I mean, a team that's going to – you you know you can bet on that team to win and win and take care of business. That used to be Alabama. That used to be, you know, Georgia. Now it's up in the air more so than it ever has been because you don't know who's more motivated that day. I, I think that has played a lot into – and I'm seeing it in basketball too. It just has. I think it's part of everything that we are dealing with now with college football. I can't believe we had an hour and a half show and didn't talk about Auburn's instant play appearance. I'm kind of glad we didn't. I'm going to talk to you, man. I want to talk about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, let's that's get into what I'm talking about, honestly. Yeah. But yeah, but we got spared because UConn is uh, beating Northwestern 40 to 18 at halftime right now. Look, North, UConn would have beat Auburn to death. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, th I, but here's the thing. How much different does the fan base feel losing in a Sweet 16, getting into the yeah. second weekend? I think that was the benchmark that most of the fan base wanted to see. Now, I'm going to be honest. I've seen some of the commentary, um, and I'm not going to call any names, but some of the things that have been said as it pertains to Bruce that I just absolutely disagree with. I mean, I – you're never going to get me to agree with some of the things that were said as it pertains to 
you know, win or be gone. Like when you look at the depths of what he brought Auburn to, he's got the most NCAA appearances of any coach in Auburn basketball history. He's got two conference championships and two SEC tournament championships. So half of what Auburn has done over its entire history, the only final four appearance. There are teams that go out in the first round every year. Virginia happened last year when Furman hit that big shot against them. Yeah, Purdue. Purdue, Purdue. multiple years in a row. Kentucky, two two of the last three years. Yeah. Right. Guys. It happens. It's not the end of the world. Yes, it was terrible, and you you deserve to be disappointed. But be realistic in your disappointment, and and be cautious in some of the things you say. Okay. It. Yes, you're entitled to hot take, but be measured. Okay. Be respectful. I, I'm. I'm just. I don't understand some of the things that get said sometimes, and I understand that's passion. And that's fandom, and fan is short for fanatic. But I, I just, given what he's done at Auburn, I just, I, I thought there were some sh- there's some things that were said that were over the top completely. Hmm. So uh, eight days, April sixth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I will say uh, this, you know, looking ahead for the week, the next time we reconvene here on the show, Caleb Edwards is coming in from California. Auburn's going to practice again Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday this, this week. Another, uh, like we mentioned earlier, another big Saturday in recruiting coming up. Caleb Cunningham's coming in, five star wide receiver. Travis Smith's coming in. I think he's about as high as a four star as you can get. Yep. Will will we see the next week will be uh, a day? Will we see who's who's on Longstreet come back? Also, Jonte Gilbert, who I think is a top 100 player, is coming in Friday. Uh, uh, Andrew, man, I'm telling you what, Ben Angamoa and the and the tight ends that he's getting on campus. He had AJ Ea here this past weekend. He's got Caleb Edwards coming in tomorrow on Monday. Andrew Olesh is coming in on Friday of next week. Um, and he's already got two guys committed. He wants one more. Uh, Caleb Cunningham, Duke Johnson. I don't think he's coming. He committed to Alabama. Sam Turner's coming in. I never heard of that guy. Uh, then the, some more 2026s are going to be in as well. Not 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 a huge week. Uh, Dia Bell is supposed to be in. He's a four star 2026 quarterback supposed to come that's, in. It's a big one. He's really good in the 2026 class. To steal a quote from my man Cole. The Ben Angamoa slander will not stand on this podcast. Uh, and on, on top of that, I look, stuff some guys in a locker, Ben. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, stuff a few in a locker. Jake Thornton, you get right there behind me, my man. We're going to have full on bully mode. I like it. I love what they're doing this year on the line of scrimmage with the mid skill talent. Carday Smith was in. We didn't mention him. Oh, Carday it's Smith. a big one. Big one. You've already got Spencer Dolan. You've got Tavares Dice. You've got Ty Buster. If you can get Carday Smith in, you're still looking at maybe three. I'm, I'm thinking six to seven total offensive linemen in this class. That would be four. So you look if you got Carday Smith in. Now you're looking for two to three more. We've seen Obalabala, Babalola, <laughs> Babalola. Yeah, I, I, I was dyslexic. I was pronouncing it backwards. <laughs> um, who else was in there? Oh, the kid. Uh, just Josh Petty was in. Yeah, Brody Shaw. Brody Shaw was in. Man, you can get one of those three guys to add on. Yep. So a lot looking good on the offensive line. Who's the uh, the guard from South Georgia that's coming up to visit Ward? Is that correct? Yes, that's a very important J- one. Jacoby J- Ward. Jacoby. Jacoby Ward is coming in. And his um, teammate is Herbert Third Scroggins, who we I, oh yeah, the I, I, like. I love that kid's tape. I, Juan I mean, Gaston I, was another one that was in too. Who, who's yeah. that? Juan Gaston was also oh, in. Big one. Great day in the morning that day. <laughs> yeah, oh, gosh. Let me put y'all on the hot seat real quick. Oh. Mm. Carde Smith. I know what he said in y'all's interview that he's gonna wait to commit right before his senior year. Do you guys think he lasts that long? I don't. I think I I I, I Honestly, no. I'd probably be surprised if he's not committed by the end of April. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it, was a, gr- it was a big visit for him. Yeah, there's just so many Auburn connections on that one. Antonio Coleman was with him. His mother was here. She, um, she's all new to this. So I think it was a very big visit. They came in Friday. They stayed until Sunday. They got to do everything, see everything, talk to everybody. And I think Auburn knocked it out of the park. And I, I, I mean, I put in a – Cole already had one in. I put in my prediction. I wanted to see how this weekend went. But it was uh, rave reviews from his team. When I saw the quote, Auburn wants me and I want to be here. Yeah. That's what made me think, okay, you followed that with, I'm going to take my OVs and, you know, I'll, I'll commit I, for my senior year. When, when a kid makes a statement that strong. As soon as I heard him say that, I said, well, that's going to be the lead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and here's the thing. If Auburn wants him committed to commit, I think he will. And I, and I do think they want him. I think they want him in this class. They want to go ahead and get him in. If he wants to take some visits, fine. But I think they want him to go ahead. And, if, if, if they do, I, and I think they do, if they push for him, and I think they will, he will go ahead and pop. I One agree. last thing. I'm going to put Jeffrey on the spot here. How insanely smart is that? Think about all the years that Gus didn't go ahead and, and like, he just waited on yes. those top-tier guys right. and, and did not go ahead and take guys that were right there, but they weren't the top one. you got to push them off that ledge, man. I mean, hell, other, you don't think Alabama's over there pushing Duke Johnson and, and Derek Smith and Antonio Coleman? You don't think they're pushing them? USC is not pushing for all these guys to commit to build some momentum. They just landed another guy as y'all were talking. That's like their fifth commitment today. <laughs> Gus USC Cordova. got another one. Yeah, they landed uh, Gus Cordova out of Texas. And there is there's him. there's monetary incentive here to go ahead and commit. I mean, it, it's it's not illegal anymore. I mean, I mean, it, it, here's an extra five. We want you in right now. Correct. And I wonder if they're working an angle with California state law on that one, Zach. Yeah. Because there are still certain states that – I'm with you, Jeffrey. There's there's what we call signing bonuses. Sure. And then there's actual contracts you can pay out while they're still in high school. And I know <laughs> in the state of California you can do that. Yeah. But how does that work if the money's coming from California to a different state? I, I don't know what the workaround on that is. But these that's top, interesting. These top 300 recruits that are committing is NIL incentive. We talk about incentive. The com, the, the incentive to commit now is NIL related. Uh, we saw it last year with Cam Coleman with, with A&M. Um, and we're seeing it this year. And good for them, right? I mean, is is I'm not saying no, one way or the other. I think every one of us on this panel agree that kids have, their, it, have every right to make money, period. So, like you're saying, there's no contract, right? That's the thing. You know what that means. Correct. They can flip again. There's nothing to hold them to that. They can take your money and, and walk away. And don't have to give it back. And you don't have to look any further than what just happened at Iowa this week. Caden I was Proctor. about to say, Caden Proctor said, I'm going to be here for a month, and I'm going to go right back to my apartment. I'm going to I'm gonna take my 100 grand that you gave me, and I'm going to say, peace, I'm out. If, if you're feeling overwhelmed by this right now because it sounds so dreadful, I understand that. There is a way around this, though. There is a way for the market to correct itself. Schools have got to not do that. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Cold. That's not going to happen. But what starts happening when your investment's bad? And there's going to be some bad investments out there. You're going to be very, very, you're going to be hesitant to make a similar investment. Certain so businessmen will. Got to, you've got to let the market correct itself. It's going to take a year or two. It's going to take maybe f- five to ten years. See, I said, that, I said that like two years ago, Cole, and I just don't know, man, because you have so many boosters that are so competitive about their team. Like that is their passion. You you think about some of these guys that post on the message board, and then you think about that passion that runs that deep with somebody that's got a, several million dollars in the bank, and they just want to win, man. They don't care what it costs. They just want to win. Yeah. And so I don't know if the if the market's ever going to correct itself unless there's some version of regulation. I just don't. I think that there will always be somebody that will pay somebody. There's always somebody that's going to want to pay that kid. Always. Always has been. Always will be. Correct. 
And the question is, is Auburn able to find different sourcing? That's my thing. I think we've got some passionate guys, too, that are absolutely bankrolling NIL right now. But when you exhaust that, do you have the opportunity to have additional revenue? And that's that's what I don't know. And I, I hear you on that. That's, that's the course correction, Cole. I'm with you. Do you burn through who you have in your arsenal? Yeah. It's got yeah. To and you, you – at some point, and I think schools were doing this at first. Now they're starting to go, well, it's, there's no way I'm going to keep my job if I don't do this. They were going, look, this is your NIL valuation for us. You want more than this? Not going to do it. This is our hard line we're setting with you. This is how good we think you are, basically. But they realize, well, I'm not going to get anybody if I do that. So maybe it's just wishful thinking on my part. <laughs> I but, don't think it's wishful thinking. I think there's some some logical thought to it, Cole. I just I well, just thought I, I'm the thinking, course we're gonna I'm thinking strictly monetarily and how the market works you know, generally works. Because that's what this is now. I mean, this is a huge market. It is, man, in a normal business, I would agree with you. But I just I feel like there's so much passion with college boosters that it's hard for me. Like they these guys were spending money on facilities for no reason before, right? You yeah. know what I mean? Year over year. Now you're just moving that pot. It's no longer facilities. You're investing in personnel. Auburn Auburn timed it perfectly. They got their new facilities because all money now is going to be going to personnel. Absolutely. I was talking to Laramie Tunstall. He, he's been working out at Auburn every day. And he was talking about the facilities. And he was like, man, NFL, they don't have – they don't have – our facilities aren't even this nice. Because they spend all their money on the players. Correct. And they know they got them under contract. So what are you going to go do? Yeah. Do you, you going to leave us because they got a better facility over there? No. No. You're going to choose us, not because of facilities. You're going to choose us because we value you more. We will pay you more. And to me, that will be when the colleges regain power, Cole, is when you do enter into collective bargaining and now they got you. Okay. And here's the thing. Kids are living their best life right now. Okay. I, and this well, is not oh, me. Th They're going to fight that. They're going to fight that. You know, These kids right now happen. have it made. Because they can transfer whenever they want. They get paid now at this point. There is – nothing to keep them from entering the portal multiple times to do a, what I would call a market evaluation of your skill set. Now, I don't blame them. If I were these kids and I were their age, no, yeah, I would sure. do the same thing. Okay. How do you know? But <laughs> when you enter into collective bargaining and now you have a contract that holds you to it. And here's the thing. These kids also, some of them don't quite understand how much a scholarship pays for. And don't think that's not going to come out of your contract now. OK, don't think that bottom of that 70 grand in aid that you get each and every year, housing, food in pro contracts, all that comes out. You're paying for your travel sometimes. Mm -hmm. These kids don't pay a lick for travel at this point. So I think it's going to be an eye opening experience when we finally get to that next stage. And not just because of the football aspect of it, but what is it going to do to all the other Olympic sports? And I've been talking about that. People don't realize how a how an athletic department works where you got really two sports that generate revenue and everything else runs at a deficit. And are you really going to continue to run multiple? Like Auburn has 18 athletic programs, right? There's no way you're going to fund all those. You're going to do what you got to do from a Title IX standpoint to make things equal, and you're going to roll with like six. And everything else is going to be a high-end club sport. Yep. Real quick, my final thoughts. Jason Caldwell and I, we've been doing this for 20-plus years. Standing up there, we were talking about, I think, Cole, you might have been in there as well. But watching the players come into the facility, dude, we you know we, were, we remember when there were mopeds and bicycles. Dude, now you got jacked-up trucks with spinners and, you know, Camaros. Woo! I mean, these guys <laughs> – are driving cars and trucks and it was just it's just it was it's a big change from what i remember you know i'm not i'm sounding a little bit like philip marshall aren't I? 
<laughs> Back in my day, I used to walk to the facility. You know what? If we could only be so lucky. Yeah, P. Marsh is one of my absolute favorites to listen to and to learn from in some of his writing, man. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it, a, it, it's a big change, man. Seeing all these, everybody drives a new car these days. Everybody's got a new car. No, a I new truck, jacked up. I mean, you know, and not just a new car, but I mean, with, with, with all the accessories. Mm hmm. Uh, all right, let's end it there, man. We're going to come back uh, midweek. We'll have a little recruiting show Wednesday, and then we'll be back next Sunday. Keep an eye on Auburn Live on 3 for all the recruiting news, maybe some commitments, uh, maybe some surprise visitors coming in. We'll have all that at Auburn Live on 3. Don't forget, we've got the uh, $1 for two months for the YouTube listeners. AU1? AU1. Yeah. Two months for $1. Don't tell anybody. Uh, we appreciate everybody tonight. Kevin got us started. Man, we had some really good discussion questions tonight. Kevin from Wilmer, Anthony, fantastic. Oh, as always, Alex from Moulton, and Steve from North Carolina, who says, kind of like, we'll be back. He will be yeah, back. He did. We will, I, I've got it written down, Steve. I will apologize if and when that ever does happen. Uh, one more time, in or around Auburn, Opelika, Lee County, looking for real estate, looking for to sell your home, buy a home, uh, look no further than uh, Miss Jessica Andrews. She's a five-star realtor. I promise you. Don't call me a liar. I'm fighting words. Give her a call, 334-704-4442. Tell her we sent you. All right, folks, thanks again for listening. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you back next week for Alan Head, for Zach in the back, who stayed in the front for Cole Pinkston. I'm Jeffrey Lee, man. Y'all stay in that left lane. See ya.